The Book of Recollections, Episode 20, Through the Shadows, by Dysylvania. Hello, dear reader, and welcome back. I see you're eager for news and esoteric knowledge, so let's dive in without delay. We have had time to rest and recover, as did our heroes. A month had passed since the tragedy that befell Greenspring. The repercussions of that terrible event were only just beginning to emerge, though, in some places, the suffering continued. Leo and Jen found themselves exhausted, drenched and filthy, caught up in circumstances stranger than they had anticipated, when they were summoned back to the counselor's mansion. Upon their arrival, Castiel greeted them at the door, and they quickly realized the mansion resembled more a sanatorium rather than a dwelling. As they stepped inside, faces both familiar and unfamiliar emerged from various nooks and crannies. Adam was hunkered down behind a mountain of books in a dark corner. Grace woke up after a fitful sleep on two chairs, and Pax stumbled in after hours of policing Greenspring. Shaq was tinkering with a sharp and unsanitary instrument, seemingly unfazed by the fact that half of his face was missing. Hooded figures wandered distractedly until Castiel whispered instructions to them. Distant screams echoed from the depths of the house and, to crown it all, loud bangs followed by the distressed cries of a child filled the air. In the midst of the chaos, the heroes understood they had been gathered at Castiel's behest, though the reason was yet to be mentioned. Once assembled, Castiel revealed that he sought a most perilous favor from them. He asked them to entrust their lives to him as he led them to the land between life and death in order to retrieve a magical trinket. Unknown to one another, they all had their reasons for embarking on such a dangerous journey, some for family, some for knowledge, and some out of sheer hubris. After debating the risks to the crown, the potential moral degradation from engaging in heretical acts, and the problematic implications of venturing into the lair of the entity that had caused so much death not long ago, they ultimately agreed to participate. The preparations began, and Jen was tasked with preparing a hearty meal using ingredients provided by Castiel's family. I'm not sure I want to know what provided means in this context. I hope the children are okay. Meanwhile, the rest of the group was led to the basement. As they ventured deeper into Leo's home, he couldn't help but wonder why hooded figures with pickaxes were heading into his winery or why his cheese storage facilities housed bandaged, foul-smelling people. The sight of some individuals with strange limbs grafted onto them was particularly alarming. Nonetheless, after braving the confusion and various unpleasant odors, our heroes reached a room that reeked of foreboding. The walls were adorned with strange symbols painted in what looked like dried blood. Monstrous creatures were perched above six stone slabs, similarly decorated with runes, and, at the center, lay a stone altar. There, the heroes were required to sacrifice either a part of their flesh or their deepest fears, as each had to give up something willingly for the ritual to succeed. After making their sacrifices, the offerings were taken to the kitchens. Dinner was a grueling affair, with Castiel greedily consuming the delicious smelling stew that Jen had prepared, while the others were given a sickly looking porridge. As they reluctantly took spoonfuls of the not so inviting meal, Castiel devoured the stew like a starving beast. The more he ate, the more grotesque the scene became. As they watched and ate, they found it increasingly difficult to stay awake. Before long, our heroes fell into a stupor, and cold hands guided them, along with the now engorged and food-stained Castiel, back to the room where they had made their sacrifices. With the heroes lying on makeshift beds, tubes inserted into their stomachs, a cripple, a child, and a hag as their guardians, and a madman as their guide, in that very room, a heretical ritual was to be performed. There, our heroes would willingly taste death. After they had submerged themselves willingly into the unknown, our heroes awoke to a strange landscape, 
and an even stranger feeling overwhelming them. They had no sense of the bodies they had gotten so well acquainted with, feeling as if they were weightless and could fly away with a mere thought. Furthermore, a strange tendril made of light had burrowed out of where their chest had been, slithering away into the unknown. All around them was a thick, dense fog, and they themselves were seemingly on a boat, surrounded by dark shades whimpering slowly. At the far side of the boat, a skeletal silhouette was standing tall, carefully steering the boat downstream. Our party would soon manage to find themselves on the same vessel, identifying each other by feeling rather than senses. But, as soon as they did so, strange craven creatures, made out of darkness, spawned from under the robes of the oarsmen. They would venture to the shades on the boat and reach into their mouths to pull out two coins, which they would then deposit into their own crooked maws. The first to realize the dangers they were in were Grace, Leo, and Pax, as they were most familiar with the rites of the astrals. As for the rest, the danger was made abundantly clear when the shades that had no coins to give to the craven beings were wholeheartedly devoured instead. As soon as the danger was made quite obvious, our heroes started seeking ways to appease the toll collectors. Some of them resorted to stealing the coins from the shades around them, a few of them, such as Shaq, Jen, and Grace, even managing to do so. However, that act didn't come without the cost, as visions of the Shades' deaths pulled away at their being, sapping away their strength. Others had begun investigating their tethers, hoping they would provide some sort of escape from the immediate danger. Last but not least, Pax resorted to trying to negotiate a way out of their situation, marching up to the oarsman and demanding that he show mercy to both them and the shades that couldn't produce the coin required for the passing. Alas, no matter how much honey and vinegar Pax could pour into his words, there would be no negotiations with the master of the crossings. However, a bit of respite was granted to our brave heroes, they managed to produce various flying instruments, from spells to even a carpet that would lift them up from the vessel and fly them towards their tether. But upon approaching the being at the other end of the chain, they looked in desperation, as the boats that were carrying them had started sinking into the dark waters of the Sabbath River, and, one by one, all our heroes seemed to be heading down the same path. The being that they had been tethered to, a shade made of light, was pulling them into the depths. Alas, at the last moment, before the water would embrace them, the darkened sand that was waiting beneath the tides came to embrace them and save them from the road they would only walk once. The next moment they regained consciousness, they were greeted by a more familiar landscape, although the improvement was only marginal. They seemed to be in Greenspring, but a more faded version of it, where everything but themselves and their tethers was made of the same blackened sand that had saved them from the embrace of the Sabbath waters. They had been separated from each other, with Pax and Grace being together, Leo and Jen, and finally Shaq and Adam, all of them in a different part of this mirrored Greenspring, with their only lead being the one quite literally attached to them. Thus. They started following it, and as they went after the tether in a serpentine paths winding through the darkened city, they had a strange feeling that something was watching them from the shadows, probing away at the corners of their mind. One by one, they reached the shade that they had been tethered to, and to each pair, a different scene was revealed. To Adam and Shaq, a shade looking like an old man was carrying their tether, which resembled an infant, and begging for scraps of food and coins. To Leo and Jen, their tether seemed like a child who had been surrounded by bullies who were forcing him to steal. To Pax and Grace, an old classroom filled with shades and a demonic-looking teacher was questioning their own tether. And so, with these still frames of life being presented to them, each of the heroes did whatever they considered best, either for their shady tether, which they understood represented the link to their own bodies, 
or for their own consciousness. Shaq would teach his shade to cling to life by the skin of its teeth and never let go, no matter how much they would be pushed aside. Grace would teach the shade to stand up to the demonic teacher and not swallow up its emotions, and Jen would teach the shade that even the smallest of evils still has its consequences. As they did so, the landscape would change and they would have to move on to another location where a different scene would unfold. And all the while, there was something nasty gnawing at their minds, trying to push them to do things in a certain way, a way that would guarantee pain and suffering either to them or to their shade. But with every success, they moved on a little further and something was beginning to take shape in the center of the town. With every Adam that managed to help his shade save an old man from plague and famine, for every Leo that would teach his shade compassion in the face of suffering, and for every Pax that would help his shade bear the burdens of other sins, the apparition in the center of town gained more mass and started resembling a gate. Alas, when the final painful scenes had passed, several things had become clear. For Grace and Pax, when the demonic teacher ended up destroying himself and one of his students, they realized that those were fragments of Castiel's own life. For Adam and Shaq, when the old man lay dead, trampled by expensively dressed shades, they realized that the shade they had been tethered to had a powerful disdain for those it perceived as being above itself. For Jen, when she saw her grandfather violently pushing away their tethered shade as it tried to prevent him from sinking its teeth into what seemed to be the silhouette of a girl, she realized that she herself would one day be forced to make such a decision based on the road she chose to pursue. Regardless of these revelations, by the time they came to their senses, they had to battle their way up to the newly formed gate towering in the middle of the city. All the while, the thing that had stalked them from the shadows and plagued their thoughts was making its debilitating presence known to them, desperately trying to prevent them from escaping. After cutting their way through nightmares and malevolent shades, they had to flee towards the gate, as all around them, the buildings made of blackened sand had begun crumbling under violent winds brought forth by their stalker. When they finally made their way to the gate, they were together again, but alas, their way was barred by the gatekeeper. Battered from the storm and their previous battles, they ventured forth in a desperate attempt to cut the beast down, with a few of them almost falling in battle. With Pax, Leo and Grace almost being brought down by the repugnant monster's bile spew, they nevertheless managed to defeat it only for it to reveal that it hid inside it a piece of Jen's grandmother's heart. Thus, without a moment to lose, they collected their occult reward and ventured forth through the gates of death, only to be yet again reborn. This was the recap for episode 20 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I was Ruxandra Vorotnek, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim, The Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 p.m. UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thanks for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.